Jason Taylor, and Elsie in the Chizat, and Courtney and B in the chat as well, and also the period person. Uh, Tim. Yeah. I, I, I can assume you're recording. Yep. So I was just like, I took a walk a couple of nights ago. It might have been last night. I can't remember. Maybe it was last night. Anyway, I was just thinking about stuff. So I wrote some stuff down. I have some questions to ask you, Eric. And this assumes, all right, just, it's just, it could be a silly question. Yes, so here it is. Everybody finds intrinsic value in something. It's different for everybody, even if both people find value in the same thing, because they give different reasons to define the intrinsic value. Um, Could you repeat that, please? I suppose. <clears throat> everybody finds intrinsic value in something, and if there are two people that find intrinsic value in the same thing, then they're not finding intrinsic value in the same thing because they give different reasons for it. Um, people need intrinsic value to survive, is my question. Well, <laughs> I think the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is you can think about it from the other angle and say people need intrinsic motivation. They need to be motivated intrinsically for their own reasons to doing whatever it is they're doing. That seems to infer or make it possible to infer then that it's necessary for you to view things as having intrinsic value. But it's really the, I think, the valuing behavior uh, and the, the relinquishment of, of control by giving up relativism that ultimately... Uh, makes you poo. Okay. That's an interesting answer. So, I mean, like, what about some guy who's addicted to heroin and he's been for years, got no job, he's got no wife, he's got no home. He, uh, but he doesn't want to kill himself. You know, I think it's a cop out. He, I, doubt he finds intrinsic value in, in the use of heroin. What does he then find intrinsic value in living itself? Or does well, I mean, not I, I, just, I disagree with the first part completely. I think, in fact, that, that um, drug addiction is a perfect example of an intrinsic motivation. I'm motivated by my own reasons. There's no external pressure on me to do drugs. If anything, the pressure is the opposite for me not to do drugs. So... I am intrinsically motivated in the sense that uh, I'm doing it for my own reasons, not because other people are trying to get me to do it, for using whichever methodology they use, including money and or threats and or the equity of some sort, you know, various ways people encourage people to do shit. Instead, it's intrinsically motivated. The, the idea of intrinsic motivation is that if you if you think that the work you're doing is like that heroin addict thinks heroin is, then you'll be great because you're, you know, but nobody ever is going to get that addicted to work. No, they're going to want Yeah. Because you can't really get addicted to work. It doesn't really scope with me like that, I suppose. But I, I, I don't mean to be dodging sort of the implicit question there, which is, but isn't, isn't it bad to be addicted to heroin? Yeah, it is. And is that really what the person wants? Well, no, not in the bigger sense. It's like they want it right now, but they don't want to be a heroin addict. There's a difference. So they want to not be a heroin addict, but they don't want to have to undergo addict. the difficult part of quitting. So what is he finding and what is he finding his value in if he's just addicted to heroin? Like how does why is he not killing himself? Well, first of all, most heroin addicts prior to the infantilization of heroin addiction by the government, were fully functioning members of society. There, there's, no, there's no tragic stories in the gutter with these most heroin addicts by, by nature. To the extent that they end up that way, it seems to correlate strongly with the fact that we've all bought into these narratives, that you can't be a functioning heroin addict. You can. And prior to, uh, I don't know, 1940 or 30 or something, Almost all 
opio, opio, opioid addicts in the United States were fully functioning addicts with jobs and all that kind of shit. And, and it's the black market and the increase, unnecessary increase in prices, the, the stigma is all the other fucking baggage that comes along with it that ends up causing the damage. I mean, not that hip doing being on heroin is a good idea, but it's like this. At some point, maybe I should quit smoking cigarettes. I don't know, but I'm not. I'm not willing to to do that because I'm aware of what that landscape looks and feels like. It looks like a long fucking battle. Until even when I win the battle, it just means I'm most of the time not thinking about wanting a cigarette. I'm still occasionally thinking about wanting a cigarette. And even years later, you smell cigarette smoke and go like, ah. I, mean, I quit for 10 years. So I know what it's like. And I have no interest in, in climbing that mountain because it's fucking massive and detailed. It's both. Okay, I agree with you. I, I see what you're saying, the whole, you know, everything. But you didn't entirely answer my question, which is why. So what if this man's fully functioning or, or, or not? He is an opioid user, and he's not killing himself. He's got no job. He's got no real relationships. But why? Why has he not killed himself? What What is his motivation other than? Because he can't. Am I wrong? Can Can he find value in just doing heroin, or is the value in in the possibility that he won't be doing heroin? In the well, he's, he's obviously finding more value in doing it than not doing it. We know that because he's persisting in doing it. At least in the short term, he's finding more value. But the other thing to remember is, if you're in the throes of an addiction that's hardcore, like my alcohol addiction was towards the end, where I was struggling to find those windows of not drunk to sort of slap things together again so I could, you know, make it move forward. I mean, it's a... you You don't necessarily want to kill yourself. You might want to die. Uh, it, you don't feel... I, I never felt depressed like I wanted to kill myself, you know? I always felt like I don't deserve to be alive because I'm I'm inflicting harm on others, at least casual sort of light harm. And most importantly, I'm completely wasting my life. So... I mean, what what's the worst crime you could possibly commit? Waste your life. That's true. Interesting answers. I don't know. I mean, it's anything you want, any more you want to say about that? <coughs> Suicide's the most wa- aggressive way to waste your life. Right. It's the most. It's the most irredeemable. That's the problem with it. It's irredeemable. I didn't think I was redeemable. I didn't think there was any way I was going to be able to quit drinking. Or I, I, that was, those were the narratives I was telling to defend my drinking, I suppose. But it's too, I'm too old. I, those, those sort of methodologies don't work on me. A, it won't work on me because I'm too smart for it. And, in fact, you know, that's true, but it did, it did work enough. I, I was able to, I was able to um, humble myself enough for it to work enough for me to find the footing I needed to to uh, toss it. Death is never the answer, but it is always the outcome. I want to try and answer this in a chat from a couple messages ago. She said, do people need reasons not to kill themselves? I would say that they kill themselves because they have reasons to kill themselves. Do they need reasons not to kill themselves? I mean, everybody has reasons not to kill themselves. People that I, do kill themselves have People reasons. kill themselves because they see, they, they have no, because they, because all the optimism has gone. You know, it doesn't matter if you can, if you can, realistic, if you can put your faith into the absence of salvation, then, and believe it wholeheartedly, there's no salvation for you, no redemption, and only an ongoing succession of ever-worsening failures until a bloody and violent end. 
You might as well save everybody the hassle. But you got to believe that to the core of your body and the core of your soul that you are irredeemable. I think, in my mind, for me to kill myself, I'd have to believe that wholeheartedly. And I'm the furthest thing in the world from that. I've always believed myself redeemable, even when I was saying I wasn't. I don't know who hasn't thought of killing themselves. Not like, you know, I'm going to do it on Tuesday with a gun, but like, you know, what would happen if you did? Just like if you're mad at somebody, you'd be like, man, I wonder what would happen if I just like ripped his head off. Right, yeah. I mean, I think we've all walked through the imagination. Have you been around one? What, a suicide? Mm-hmm. I had a friend kill himself when he was in his early 30s. It still bothers me a great deal. I wasn't I wasn't there to witness it. I found out later. Yeah, I went to I you know, I grew up in Boise, Idaho and I moved to Virginia when I was 12. And I had a kid, he was my friend all through. His name was Paul, Paul Michael, I think. Was his full name. Anyway, that might have not been his name. I feel bad for not remember. But anyway, he, he killed himself when I was like 16, and he was 16 too. It's kind of hard to wrap my head around it still. It's so it's the, I don't know, it pisses me off. Pisses me off too. Sixteen years old. I couldn't wait a couple of years to get over it. Am I the one who's frozen? I guess it's me. More likely to be me than both of you two concurrently. No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry. You know, I'm I'm trying to come off energy drinks right now. You know, it's not something, obviously, it's not something to contemplate suicide over. Of course, I haven't. But I, I will use that to explain my over, over paleness of the night and my tiredness. Um, unnecessary excuse. You, you shouldn't explain things like that. Say and I both were going the same path there. You shouldn't explain shit like that. And nobody was thinking of that shit. It makes it an issue. And even if they were thinking of that shit, um, they they don't have a conclusion about it until you give them one. It's just up in the air. I suppose. It's true. It's important. Well, I was just thinking about it. I mean, I was thinking about it for like 10 minutes, but it seems sli- at least slightly relevant. I'm not scolding you. I, I'm just giving unsolicited advice, my favorite thing to do. Oh, it is, it's mine too. Probably Taylor's as well. Although I'm starting to like yeah. the, the silent, smug. You know what I'm talking about. Well, it's, it's a matter of getting to be able to take advantage of the visuals from an observer's perspective. Normally, when you're schooling people, you don't really get to see the footage of your own face later schooling them. And say, oh, if I, if I, if I cranked up the contemptuous dismissal in that smile a little bit, it might be even more effective. Well, I don't have anything more to add to this topic. So you think that's it for this, for your recording? Oh, yeah, I forgot we're recording this. I don't want you to be sad, host Tim, okay? If you think you've had too many energy drinks, and what I want you to do is to take some laxatives.